Fusion Mobile, quality e-learning experience on the go. Hello guys, um, good afternoon. You're welcome to Fusion Mobile Biology Clinic. I'm Dr. Corey and I'll be taking you on animal biology. Okay, so first we're going to talk about nutrition. Our topic for today is nutrition. And the format we're going to use to discuss nutrition is as displayed on the board. First, we're going to talk about, we're going to introduce the subjects, nutrition. Then we'll discuss the modes of nutrition, there are several modes of nutrition. The organisms have adapted, you know, for this purpose. And then we're going to talk about classes of food, taking it a little further to discuss balanced diet. And we're going to wrap it up with malnutrition, discussing malnutrition. So let's go. What's um, nutrition? Um, this term has been used by different persons and dif different people at different times to mean different things. But for the purpose of a unified definition, it's fair to say that nutrition is the uh, making of food available to cells of organisms for basic functions, body functions. So by that we mean that nutrition is consuming nutrients for growth and repair of body tissues. Okay, all living things basically need food to grow. If you remember the um, characteristics of living things that we discussed um, earlier, we said uh, Mr. Niger D. Yeah, that's the mnemonic that most people use to remember the characteristics of living things. The N in the Niger there stands for nutrition because all living things need food in one way or the other. Either they produce their own food or they depend on other organisms for food. Basically, all living things need food, need nutrients in one way or the other. Now, the modes of nutrition differ because organisms have adapted different mechanisms to obtain the food, different mechanisms to get nutrients. Um, for this purpose, we are going to divide um, modes of nutrition into three parts. There's the first we're going to talk about is the heterotrophic mode, then we're going to talk of autotrophic and then the mixotropic. When we talk heterotrophic, it simply means that organisms have to depend on other organisms for their own food. They do not create their own food. Okay? The word auto means self. When we say auto, we mean self, by yourself, automatic. Okay? So, autotrophic organisms uh, or better say, better still, autotrophs. Autotrophs are organisms that can create their own food. Okay, auto and troughs. Trough means feeding. The word trough means feeding. So autotrophs can generate their own food. Examples of autotrophs, you can divide them into chemosynthetic and photosynthetic. Okay, photosynthetic, like we said earlier, organisms that can create their own food from using chlorophyll, sunlight, um, carbon dioxide, and water. Those organisms are called chemosynthetic um, photosynthetic organisms. Whereas the organisms that de depend on oxidation of chemical substances for the generation of energy are called chemosynthetic organisms. But then the heterotrophic organisms cannot do all this. Okay, they cannot generate their own food, rather they depend on the autotrophs for their food. And this includes saprophytes, parasites, symbiotic organisms, and holozoic organisms. The advantage that these have is that they can move around to generate their food. They can move around to source for food. Whereas organisms like um, plants, basically trees, they cannot move around. They just have to sit at a place and then nature makes it easier for them to generate their own food since they do not have that ability to move around okay so examples talk, let's go back to the heterotrophs now so we said saprophytic organisms parasitic organisms symbiotic organisms and then holozoic organisms all these are examples of heterotrophic organisms let's take them one after the other the saprophytes saprophytic organisms are those that can generate um that have the ability to degrade substances okay they, they um, generate energy by action of degradation all right if for instance um, i'm sure everybody here has at some point or the other had spoiled food or let's say sometimes basic as bread 
okay you leave a piece of bread on the table and you travel for like three four days one week and then you come back and then you see that uh, it's turning um, grayish white with some mold kind of things forming on it those organisms are saprophytes they have come to degrade the piece of bread you left behind okay and that's why people usually come down with illnesses when they eat such food if you eat sports food or you eat expired food yeah, um, you, you buy canned food or canned products. If you check the cover, they always have expiry dates on them. The reason is that once it exceeds the expiry date, microorganisms come to feed on it and um, degrade it. Those organisms are called saprophytes. All right. I said they are called saprophytes. Okay, and then we said they um, carry out this by degradation they degrade the uh, um, the food substance okay now another uh, class of organism we're going to talk about are parasitic organisms parasites i'm sure at some you must have heard about parasites everybody has heard about mosquito parasites for instance it's very prevalent in our environment what are parasites? Parasites are those organisms that cause harm to their hosts by, you know, they, they, they have a relationship with the host so that they cause harm, but they don't necessarily kill the host. Okay? Unlike the relationship you have between predators and the prey, the predator eats the prey, you know, obviously the predator has to be bigger than the prey. But for parasites, the parasites are usually smaller than their host. Okay, so a small parasite comes in, invades the organism, and then derives nutrients from the organism, causing harm to the organism, but not necessarily killing that organism. Okay, such parasites can be ectoparasites, so that means they are outside the organism, or endoparasites, that means they are inside the organism. Let's take something like um, mosquito parasites, for instance, like we talked about. The mosquito parasites, um, commonly called plasmodium. That's the mosquito parasite, all right? When the female anopheles mosquito bites the individual, they um, release this plasmodium. So the vector, that means the carrier of the parasite. When you hear the word vector, vector means carrier of the parasite. Now the vector is mosquito, we shall come to this later. The mosquito is the vector for plasmodium. So the parasite itself is plasmodium, all right? The parasite is plasmodium, the vector is mosquito. So when the mosquito bites the person, it releases the plasmodium into the person's bloodstream. That means that plasmodium is what kind of parasite? It's an endoparasite because it goes into the host of the Unlike ticks, for instance. Ticks are also parasites. Where are they found? They are found in the hairs okay the probably the scalp or the pubic hair okay the pri private parts you know these are ectoparasites because they are on the surface of the organism not inside the organism okay so we said parasites can either be ectoparasites or endoparasites or endoparasites and then we said the ectoparasites are the ones that are found on the surface of the host while endoparasites are found within the host okay and then we give examples of plasmodium mosquito plasmodium from mosquito and then the ticks okay that are ectoparasites Another type of um, endoparasite, for instance, is worm. We've all heard of worm. You know, you have hookworm and all those thread worms and all the kind of worms you can think about. Okay, most of those are endoparasites because they go into the system, causing you that. So, moving on from parasites now, we want to talk about symbiotic relationship. Now, when you talk about symbiosis, Symbiosis simply means that these two organisms coexist and they have mutual benefits that they derive from each other. Okay, they are not necessarily harming each other. All right, you give me, I give you. We coexist and then we 
help each other that's called symbiosis example of symbiotic relationship is the, uh, like you can see between the sea animals and the hermit crab all right also between in plants uh, leaching fungus and uh, algae you, they, um, they, they, there exists some sort of symbiotic relationship uh, between the fungus and the algae all right moving on we're going to talk about holozoic nutrition now holozoic is the one that really concerns us as humans directly because that's where we fall in all right so i'm going to rub off all this to make it a lot less crowded okay so let's take all this off all right so holozoic nutrition we have the four different types let's narrow it down to four types of holozoic nutrition first we're going to be talking about carnivores then herbivores omnivores and then predators all right now one unique thing about um, the holozoic group of um, what's it called organisms is that they have a proper digestive system all right unlike these other ones that don't necessarily have a digestive system the holozoic organisms have a digestive system so first is the carnivores all right when you hear the word can this comes from the word canine okay carnivores think about canine they, t they are toothed okay and they eat meat okay so what kind of organisms will belong to this group we have lion we have tiger we have the leopard all right those organisms are carnivorous organisms they live on meat all right they're not interested in herbs they're not interested in your grasses and things like that they don't eat rice and all those stuff they are interested in meat all right those are carnivores then you have the herbivores from the word herb herbivores depend on herb, herbs for their food all right they live on plants grasses okay and that's where you have um, zebra you have cow goats all these households um, there are a lot of them you run out of examples all right then next we come to the omnivores the word omni omnipotent omni simply means generally okay like it's more than one it's not just a carnivore it's not just a herbivore it takes both all right so that's where we humans fall in okay humans are omnivores they eat both meat they eat plants they eat anything you can think of they are omnivores now it's fair to bring in predators here um we talked about predators earlier we said the difference between the predators and the parasites is that both of them cause harm to their hosts but then while one of them kills the host the other just continues to hurt and harm the host without necessarily killing the host all right so predators they are bigger animals They feed on smaller animals. Bigger animals that feed on smaller animals, they are called predators. And the smaller animals they feed on are called the prey. Okay? The prey. Alright. So, what we said, parasites. Okay. Also, the predator kills the prey unlike parasites that are smaller animals the parasites are smaller organisms that feed on bigger organisms not necessarily killing the organism
Okay, so the parasites are smaller animals or organisms. They feed on the bigger organism, not necessarily killing it. All right, so that's one major difference between the predators and the parasites. Then autotrophs, we talked about them earlier. We said these ones use, they have chlorophylls. That's one unique thing that the photosynthetic, as a matter of fact, the difference between the photosynthetic and the chemosynthetic is just the chlorophyll. Okay, the chlorophyll. The photosynthetic organism has chlorophyll, which means that they can generate their own food from sunlight, water, you know, photosynthesis, basically. While the chemosynthetic organisms require, depend on chemical substances for their own energy generation. Then there is this funny group we call the mixotropic. And the mixotrophic, okay, we said trophic means feeding. And then mixo, from the word mix. So, it's fair to say it's a type of mixed feeding, mixotropic. Um, they are mainly plants, all right? Mixotropic organisms are mainly plants, but they feed on smaller insects as well, all right? When the opportunity comes, they feed on insects. So, this includes pitcher plants, the venus fly, uh, fly trap, the bladder warts, okay, the hornets, Oriental hornets, okay, these are examples of mixotrophic organisms and we say they are plants mainly that have the ability to, you know, ingest little animals like insects the the insects just you know comes to pollinate the plant just just you know hang around and then of course it's not sus suspecting anything the fly trap just closes up in on the the insect and then eats it do digest it and that's it for such unfortunate animals okay so moving on now we would love to uh, take this further to discuss classes of food all right but before we move on to classes of food, um, I would like to, I would like us to make an attempt to ask, um, to attempt answering some questions, All right? So there are some questions that will be popping up on your screen right now. Um, let's just see how far you're following us. Okay. So I hope you've been able to attempt these questions, and if you haven't, stick around to the end of this session, and you should be able to. Um, do a lot better now let's move on to the classes of food and um, basically there are six classes of food okay um, we have the carbohydrates which we like to represent as CH2O we have the proteins fats and oil some call them lipids um, Vitamins one, two, three, four um, minerals and water. Okay, those are the f six classes of food. So we're going to take them one after the other now. All right, so let's start with carbohydrates. All right, um, basically, um, virtually everybody knows what carbohydrates are. In fact, the staple foods in Nigeria are mostly carbohydrates and pretty much most African countries we love energy giving foods a lot so starting with carbohydrates um, rice starch the starchy foods generally are carbohydrates right foods like rice yam cassava gari however you want to process it or whatever names you want to call it millet maize these are all starchy foods in different forms okay now the fact that the food is carbohydrate doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't contain any other class of food right because you you hear people say proteinous food and they mention things like beans and then they believe that there is no carbohydrate or anything else in beans that's not true the truth is it's more of starchy foods okay the starchy foods are more of the carbohydrate foods are more of starch all right that doesn't necessarily mean that they do not contain any other 
um, class of food okay so like i said earlier they're mainly energy giving foods they contain carbon hydrogen and oxygen which is why we represented them as ch2o in the formula okay so the ratio of oxygen to um, hydrogen to oxygen is obviously two to one that's why we use the ch2o formula okay now there are different types of carbohydrates we have them as monosaccharides disaccharides and polysaccharides when we say saccharide saccharide simply means sugar all right so monosaccharide means one sugar unit disaccharide two sugar or glucose units and polysaccharide several glucose or sugar units all right so examples of um, monosaccharides include fructose and glucose those are the simplest forms of sugars you can think of all right and everybody knows what glucose is glucose is that quick energy you get you know when you are really hungry or you're starving you know for instance if, if you did um, physical education in nursery primary school you notice that after every race the teachers give the children some glucose to lick or, you know or drink that's because the children need quick energy fast energy all right so that's not the time to start eating pounded jam or something it's going to take long to degrade those food to break them down because those are more complex carbohydrates all right so what you need at such times is quick energy and the simplest form of energy you can get is glucose the same applies to patients in the hospital when somebody is sick somebody is vomiting and all that and needs quick energy that's not the time to be giving the person solid food you just want to give them quick glucose to regain their energy so in a nutshell glucose is the simplest form of sugar you can get all right and it's in the class called monosaccharide because it's just one unit all right now disaccharides are um, complex sugars they are more complex than the monosaccharides obviously because we said monosaccharides one unit disaccharides two units so that makes them more complex than the monosaccharides examples of monosaccharides are disaccharides rather are maltose and sucrose all right i'll be giving you the chemical formulas as well but um i i'm not sure you will need it just in case it shows up just know what it looks like all right then the polysaccharides are the more complex ones all right they have many units of glucose linked together examples are starch and cellulose starch like we said what you see what you eat almost every day of your life gary rice um, yam all these are starchy foods and then starch is used for many other things you can use starch on your clothes some people eat starch like food and so starch generally are complex sugars why cellulose also complex sugars but they are seen more in plants okay cellulose is what makes up the cell wall in plants so that's also a type of sugar rather they are called complex sugars now the uses of star um, carbohydrates are summarized below first they provide energy it's a major source of energy so when you tell somebody not to eat carbohydrates you're simply telling him not to take energy containing foods all right if you live on proteins and fats only you'll be looking for trouble because your body needs energy of course those proteins and fats will eventually need to be broken down to glucose because the only form of energy that your brain knows how to use is glucose so why give your brain so much work to be breaking down protein when you can just give it carbohydrates since it will be broken down to glucose all right so very importantly um the glucose the carbohydrates are the energy giving foods they produce energy they provide us with energy also they're used to build certain body parts like exoskeletons and arthropods okay. so in addition to providing energy another use of for carbohydrates is that they are used to build certain body parts okay for instance in lower animals the exoskeleton of arthropods for instance um, also made of um, carbohydrates they have some proteins content too that form chitin all right but it's also um, enhanced with carbohydrates all right the same way cellulose in cell and uh, the plant cell wall uh, being carbohydrates gives it rigidity and support the carbohydrates um, in the arthropods uh, exoskeleton of arthropods also give them some form of support all right now another use for carbohydrates is that they are they consist they make components of mucus which is lubricant in our body the mucus which uh, in human body is made up of carbohydrates as well so they serve some role in that function all right so moving on we're going to be discussing proteins okay 
Examples of proteins include meat, fish, eggs, milk. All these are rich in proteinous products. And um, like we said earlier, the fact that they are rich in protein does not mean that they do not contain any other um, ingredient, um, nutrients. Okay. So now, proteins mainly function to repair worn out tissues. All right. So for tissues that are worn out, tissues that are getting old, you know, these proteins that help us replace them and repair them. Right. So in addition to repair of worn out tissues, the proteins are also known to help in generation of energy. Okay. So, but then we know that the food um, that primarily provide us with energy are carbohydrates so in the absence of carbohydrates your body goes to the proteins to help generate energy and that explains why when people are fasting you know they grow lean because what happens is that when you fast you're not taking in food and your body is not getting the carbohydrates it needs for energy so what it does is now to break down the meat in your body the flesh you know your muscles muscles are mainly protein so the body breaks down the protein of your, your the, the muscles and then use it to generate energy and then in the process the person grows lean so what we're trying to say now is that the main source of en energy in foods is carbohydrates in absence of that proteins to give energy okay and the organ that does this for us is the liver okay now moving on let's talk about uses of protein generally in a tabular form we will say it's used for growth of young ones and the growing children need plenty of protein because we said it helps in regeneration it helps in repair of worn out tissues it helps in growth so the growing children need a lot of proteins it's also used for repair of worn out tissues or cells we said that earlier it is reproduction okay it's used for production of hormones and then it's used for tissues and cell formation all right so quickly we're going to move on to the uses of protein in by way of summary we'll just rush through it so first they are used for growth of young ones you know um, like we said earlier they help in regeneration of tissues repair of worn out tissues and growth generally so this simply means that younger ones children need plenty of protein to help them grow okay now secondly they are used for repair of one of tissues we said that already thirdly they aid in reproduction proteins are important for reproduction fourthly they are used for production of hormones many of the hormones are proteins enzymes are proteins like we know many hormones as well are proteins all right then the fifth point is that they are used for tissues and cell formation for bodybuilding generally and that is why bodybuilders all those that work in gyms they encourage you to take plenty of proteins when you are trying to keep fit when you are using the gym proteins are very important for bodybuilding moving on now we are going to talk about fats and oils okay fats are referred to as lipids generally okay they contain carbon hydrogen and oxygen just like carbohydrates although they have it in a lower ratio they have oxygen in lower ratio compared to carbohydrates they contain more of calories of energy they contain more calories of energy than carbohydrates which are not as readily available so remember what we talked about um, the carbohydrates and we said the only form of energy that the brain recognizes is glucose okay the brain uses glucose so if you live on fat it will still need to be converted to glucose otherwise the brain cannot use it and if a brain cannot use it the person is as good as not existent all right so examples of fatty foods include butter include granite palm oil and so on and so forth okay fat helps in insulation all right so by that we mean that it helps you to conserve temperature so that you do not die of cold okay when the temperature is too low it's called hypothermia so what tab uh, the, the fat does for you is to insulate you so that you do not lose heat during cold situations all right the different types of fats the brown fats the white fats we're not going to go into all that but basically just take note that fat helps in insulation okay now the uses include to provide fat soluble vitamins now vitamins are in two categories there is the water soluble and then the fat soluble as the name implies water soluble means that they can dissolve in water while fat soluble means they dissolve in fat 
okay so you, we know that fat and water does not mix if you put um, take for instance when you drink your tea if you butter your bread and you sip your you, you dip your bread in tea you begin to see some lobos or local localated fat particles at the top of the, the, the tea that's to tell you that the butter cannot dissolve in that water that's why there's that separation so in the same vein if you try to transport a fat soluble vitamin in um, water environment it cannot be transported that way because you know they are not miscible okay so fat soluble vitamins include the adec that is vitamin a d e and k why the water soluble vitamins are vitamins b and c all right so fat is important for fat soluble vitamins all right another thing is that they are essential for fatty acids in and just the supply essential fatty acids to animals fat supply essential fatty acids to animals fatty acids are used to build your membranes and the cell wall so you need fats you know for this purpose all right they also help to maintain body temperature we said that earlier and they provide energy to animals in the absence of carbohydrate and protein moving on now we'll be talking about mineral salts mineral salts include calcium phosphorus manganese magnesium sulfur and all that and all that okay foods rich in mineral salts include onions green vegetables liver eggs and so on and so forth they help in healthy growth and bone formation and they are also important in blood clotting okay if you do not have these minerals in adequate proportion your blood will not clot properly all right good examples of use um, the uses of mineral salts include to regulate the metabolism of the body all right so we shall give you a table that summarizes um, the minerals and their sources their function and the deficiencies that may arise from their absence all right now moving on we're going to talk about vitamins vitamins uh basically they are for bodybuilding if you know they are just for repair of tissues they help things to function properly they don't give you energy per se they're not energy giving like the um, carbohydrates and proteins and fats all right and food rich in vitamins include vegetables milk eggs and fruits examples of vitamins you know we said that vitamins can either be water soluble or fat soluble the fat soluble vitamins we said they include vitamins a d e and k and we use the mnemonic adec to remember the fat soluble vitamins while water soluble vitamins include vitamin b and c you know b is a complex of vitamins there's the b1 tamin b2 riboflavin you know and on and so on and so on so it's not it, you might want to memorize all the b complexes and then um, you may not at this level but very importantly you should take note that vitamins can either be water soluble or fat soluble and when we talk of fat soluble adec we talk of water soluble vitamins b and c all right so below is a table that summarizes um, the vitamins their sources their functions and then what happens when you have deficiency in any of the vitamins moving on now we're going to talk about water okay water is a universal solvent we all know that okay it is composed of hydrogen and oxygen in the ratio of two to one for that's hydrogen to oxygen it's medium of it's a medium of chemical reaction in every living organism it helps in transportation as well as temperature control okay there are different sources of water streams river rain and all whatnot but what is most important is that the source of water that is coming into the human system should be a clean purified type of water all right because if you have dirty water it's a source of infection it's a source of diseases and you know many of the avoidable ailments come from dirty water sources all right uses of water include um, digestion of food it's the main component of plants and animals it is a solvent for vitamin b and c we said b and c are water soluble vitamins so water is a solvent for them water is excretion of metabolic waste the main source of excretion from the kidneys um, the main source of, um, the main route through which um, substances are excreted from the body is the kidneys and this is done in form of urine which is mostly water so water is needed for excretion water is needed for digestion water is needed for virtually all processes okay in the body 
it aids excretion of metabolic uh, substances it maintains osmotic concentration of body tissues and then transportation generally of substances nutrients hormones water is important for transportation all right then um we might talk about roughages too not necessarily because it's a class on its own but it's fair to bring them in here this consists of indigestible fibrous materials from fruits vegetables and carbohydrates they provide bulk for the intestinal content thereby stimulating most of the bowels okay roughages helps us to empty our bowels so we said that roughages are not necessarily a class of food on their own okay they are a mixture of different classes but basically um, they consist of vegetables you know um, fruits they help in emptying the bowl all right and then we said that the absence of roughages causes constipation and when you are constipated we want to give you roughages to help empty the bowl okay I think we're finished next thing we're going to talk now is balanced diet <coughs> All right, so moving on, moving on now, we're going to be talking about balanced diet. <clears throat> All right, balanced diet simply means, we all, we all know what diets are. The meals you eat, they're called diets. All right, now a balanced diet is one that contains all these classes of food we talked about in adequate proportions. Okay, when you're talking about diet, it doesn't necessarily mean the quantity of food you have taken in, but it's the quality of the food. All right, the content of the food is what makes it balanced. If you have the food nutrients in adequate quantities in the right proportions, it's termed a balanced diet. Now, that simply means that if you have any meal that the nutrients are in excess or the nutrients are under the requirements, the daily requirements, they are not balanced okay for such nutrient for such meals where the content is under the daily requirement we say it's uh it, it, we call that under nutrition when a person takes a meal where the um, nutrients are under the daily requirements they are not up to what you require for daily activities we say that's under nutrition whereas when somebody takes Whereas when somebody takes a, a meal where the nutrients are in excess of what is required daily, you say that's over nutrition. Okay, these two are imbalanced diets. Okay, and that's what gives us malnutrition. Okay, a person is said to be malnourished if he is taking nutrients that are under the daily requirements or over the daily requirements then you say the person is malnourished in practice we see more of under nutrition than over nutrition okay mostly in developing countries african like um, in africa nigeria and some other um, developing countries there there's a lot of malnutrition going on because people are undernourished okay people are taking on them not because they want to but because they cannot afford it and some that can even afford it do not know how you know they are not educated enough to know how to mix the content to have adequate nutrition okay so a balanced diet is one in which there is nutrient in the food but it's not in the appropriate quantity all right, so with that, we've come to the end of the nutrition section. Um, some questions will pop up on your screen now. It, uh, by a, a way to help you revise and understand these things better. So if you find them difficult to answer, don't panic. Just go back to the video, play it a second time, play it third, a third time if possible to understand this better and you'll be fine with it. Thank you very much and see you in the next lecture.